From Boca Raton, Florida, the home of Lynn University, and site of the 2012 final presidential debate, this is Beyond the Brief. Hello and welcome to Beyond the Brief. My name is Milan Dorji. And I am Jennifer Murillo. Hurricane Sandy changed the lives of many families that resided in the affected areas. Lynn student Ashley Cicido spoke to reporter Deborah Nabas about her experience in dealing with the aftermath of this national disaster. The results of Hurricane Sandy have left millions of Americans devastated and without power. Ashley Castacito, a sophomore here at Lynn University, shares her and her family's tragic story of the storm. I am from Wall and Belmar, New Jersey. I'm on the border of Wall and Belmar, so I'm, I'm pretty close to the ocean. My first reaction to the news was I didn't really know uh, what to say or what to do to make uh, the people in my town feel better because uh, we've heard that Sandy was coming, but we didn't think it was going to be as bad as it was. And then we realized how much uh, not only our town, but what everyone lost, and it was just it was a mix of emotions. Me and my family lost. We've lost part of the roof of our house, uh, uh, part of the garage. Um, we've trees fell down like all over our backyard and stuff. That's from what I know. Like streets were flooded. Uh, I know my work got flooded. A lot of my friends' houses, trees fell down on them. Uh, I lost like part of my childhood because a lot of those places um, I would go to all the time and now I've been learning that a lot of them just are not around anymore. Uh, my aunt lost her house. She's staying with my grandfather in another county. Uh, my family's living in the part of our house that is uh, stable and we're doing the best we can to try to deal with the situation all of us. I, because I care a lot about this and it bothers me that I'm not there helping out right now. So I want to do whatever I can, whatever I can, to make sure that um, they, everyone has what they need to be okay, because it's going to take a long time to fix things. We've made uh, a little over $300 right now. Um, we've got some clothes and food. and We've made eight signs that we've sent down to colleges and high schools. and. Uh, Teresa from OSI, she sent some stuff down when she went there last weekend and uh, they were all very thankful to get the stuff that they received. So we're going to keep going with it and just try to help out. The food and clothing drive is in the calf every day from 12 to 2 and we're going to be collecting food, clothes, anything. Uh, you could possibly donate like cash, even write a message so we can send it out to colleges and high schools. I know we went to an elementary school and we got kids to write greeting cards, so we're sending them out to different schools in a couple of days. So whatever you guys can do uh, to help out, I fully support it. Donate to the victims of Hurricane Sandy today by visiting Ashley at the Clothing and Food Drive in Perper Plaza. This is Savvy Cathy reporting for Beyond the Brief. This past week on October 29th, Turkish citizens took the streets of the capital and other major cities to celebrate the 89th year of the Turkish Republic. However, these celebrations were tainted by conflict when the Turkish police forced mother to display patriotism with batons, water cannons and tear gas. Azra Aishigal Ok reports. Tomorrow, we will establish the Republic. Mustafa Kemal Atatürk spoke these words on 29th October 1923. After all hard-fought years of war, finally Turkey was ready to look forward, turning its face to the West. Atatürk's reform significantly changed life in Turkey. Perhaps, most notably, religion was separated from the state by the secular system. This October, the Turkish Republic celebrated its 89th year. As always, citizens took to the streets, proudly carrying flags, and posters of Atatürk singing songs and visiting the Founders Museum. However, this year, Turkey's Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan attempted to restrict the celebration of the Turkish Republic's establishment, citing alleged security concern. Various Turkish organizations made arrangements to circumvent these restrictions. 
These arrangements included the chartering of the organized public transportation to and demonstrations in the nation's capital. Local police attempt, attempted to up, uphold the prime minister restrictions by using force against unarmed civilians, including but limited to beating, hosing with water cannons and shelling with tear gas. I'm Mazrai Shigirok, reporting for Beyond the Brief. Thanksgiving break is almost here. IPOL's reporter Matt Perpich asked students about their plans for the holidays and what they are most excited for. With Thanksgiving right around the corner, students are excited for the plans they have for the holidays. Let's take a look. Looking forward to the relaxation. Yeah, I'm hoping for a massage. Thanksgiving, we have plans to go up to Orlando to see a couple of our Portuguese friends from UCF. And together, we're going to Gainesville to see the Florida versus Florida State football game. Well, since I don't celebrate Thanksgiving, it's not in my culture, I am going to Boston to meet my brother. Gorge on turkey, you know, usual Thanksgiving festivities. I'm going to LA. First time in LA? No, I go every summer. Really? And uh, what will you be doing this time in LA? I'm going to go catch up with my cousins. Um, they're forcing me to go skydiving, which I really don't want to do. But uh, I'm going to try to enjoy my time. Thanksgiving is the time to be thankful for what we have. This month, RAs have been taking time out of their busy schedules to decorate their assigned hallways. They decorate the halls whatever way they like. It is up to them to decide. Thanksgiving is only a week away, and you can feel the buzz on campus. This is Matt Perpich reporting for Beyond the Brief. Last Wednesday, as part of Disability Awareness Month, Student Life hosted Wheels to the Net. A, a wheelchair basketball tournament. This fun and challenging event aims to bring students together about disability awareness. Here's Grace Paulus with the story. It was really difficult to get used to. Like, you're trying to spin around and dribble, and it's, I mean, it gets a little easier as you go along, but. When you start out, I mean, it's always difficult. It was really good. We had a student life team. And it was a lot of fun. We didn't win our first game, but like I said, we got to play against CBT and have a lot of fun doing it. As someone that uses a wheelchair, I found it as a, an amazing experience. Because it was all amazing to see people that do not use wheelchairs trying to use the wheelchair and it was amazing. I loved it. I'm going to feel this tomorrow. My arms are killing me right now. It was hard to get used to at first but then afterwards it was actually a lot of fun and a lot, learned a lot from it and now I appreciate, um, you know, when I see kids in the wheelchairs now, I respect more of them now because a lot of workout. <laughs> I brought 20 wheelchairs across the country so people could actually experience what it would be like to play in a game of wheelchair basketball. So it's kind of like sports and it's kind of like a disability simulation all wrapped into one where people get really good exercise with their arms and have a lot of fun with each other. Well, that about does it for us today. Thank you for joining us on this week's show. For all of those who are involved in social networking, remember to follow us on Twitter and Facebook through the iPulse and Beyond the Brief accounts. Hope you enjoyed this holiday week. This is Milan Dorji. And this is Jennifer Murillo. Till next time.